Hello, it looks like we are ready to get started. Welcome to our webinar. Today it is all about your digital identity. I'm going to try and explain what it looks like in the ubiquitous digital space and how you are being authenticated. Who am I? I'm just another digital identity possessor with a tendency to rant about similar topics on the Spec Ops blog. Enough about me, let's jump in with the obligatory background slide. So a quick history lesson, a very long time ago, think pre-Facebook, we were simply identified by human memory. Since then, we've gone through dozens of identification methods from display of jewelry, tattooing, physical symbols, the earliest version of the passport, until we stumbled upon the first modern ID system. It can actually be traced back to Napoleon and the ID cards he was using to keep track of the nation's workforce. Fast forward to the 1950s where the magnetic stripe with data storage capabilities was invented and a decade later where it was secured to plastic cards. Next up was the chip, eventually manifesting itself as a smart card with a microprocessor and memory. But we didn't stop there. I don't need to get into the nostalgia of pre-internet days where kids still played outside and a username and password didn't gate our social network, but for obvious reasons, our identity is evolving. We are now defined through a set of attributes, such as a username and password that may be unrelated to our specific attributes or directly tied to personally identifiable information from official credentials. To fully define the term, it's important to also understand the purpose. Digital identities are intended to be an alternative to appearing in person with paper documents. Instead, we call upon our attributes when verifying our identities during digital transactions, when proving you are who you say you are. Let's dig a little deeper into these attributes. Your attributes fall into various categories, assigned, accumulated, and inherent. Your assigned characteristics reflect relationships with other bodies. Over time, they may change. For example, changing my email address from backstreetboyfan at hotmail.com to whatever my current email is. Your accumulated characteristics are acquired over time, such as health records. They can also consist of preferences, such as language and currency, as well as your seat preference on a plane. These attributes can also change and evolve with time. And finally, there is your inherent traits, which is pretty self-explanatory, age, height, fingerprint, etc. Think about your digital routine, checking personal and work emails, online banking, and even shopping. Many of the websites we frequent require some sort of user registration before they provide services, leaving us with an array of fragmented identities. Our attributes sprinkled across sites, databases, and authoritative bodies. They all need to verify us, but the abundance of credentials can make this complicated. The complication is defined as identity sprawl, multiple identity stores of user data across many different systems, all with their own way of authenticating users. A pain to manage and maintain, especially when it comes to our passwords. So we've been a little lazy, fallen into poor practices, reusing passwords or writing them down because we don't pay attention to our identity credentials unless something goes wrong and forgetting your password is only the tip of the iceberg. So what can go wrong? That all depends on how much time you have. Identity fraud is a profitable enterprise. Your identity is associated with all aspects of your life, including your bank account. So not only is it valuable to you, but also to those who want to abuse it. Data breaches, system failures, identity theft, and misuse are all casting their dark shadows on our digital lives. Look no further than recent breaches at eBay, Adobe, Home Depot, Target, Sony Pictures, Yahoo, Dropbox, LinkedIn. The list can go on and on. If you've peeked at our blog or our ebooks and white papers, you've gotten a taste of our obsession with strong, healthy passwords. There is a real problem here, and it starts with the amount of passwords we need to memorize. Memorizing one password isn't very difficult. Memorizing 19 passwords, which some sources say is the average number of passwords we actually have to deal with, is a recipe for password fatigue. It is this shared feeling of having to remember an excess number of passwords as a part of a daily routine that encourages habits that can hinder security. So we've been taking shortcuts, creating weak, easily memorable passwords, storing them in an email, writing them down. We're reusing passwords without thinking about what will happen when one is compromised. 
One constant risk is the dictionary attack, a method of breaking into a system by entering every word from a database of commonly used words as a password. The dictionary is not necessarily limited to common names and words. Attackers can use different dictionaries such as foreign words, phonetic patterns, in addition to lists from data breaches. There has got to be a better way. We can start with not having so many passwords. Can we use a service or application without going through the sign-up and password creation process? Well, it may sound familiar because some of us are already doing this by opting to provide existing credentials on third-party web services instead of creating new accounts. Facebook and Google are prime examples here, where your existing account can be used to log into related websites or applications via the sign up with Facebook or Google account options. The benefits are abundant, managing only one username and password, which will be stored in one database instead of being repeated across multiple databases. To get a little deeper, what we're looking at here is an identity management system that permits the use of attributes across multiple organizations. What we're looking at here is federation. A federation is an agreement between two parties. It essentially allows one party to leverage the existing infrastructure of another to authenticate. Think of it as a way to connect identity management systems together. In this system, your credentials are contained within the home organization, the identity provider. The identity provider, which would be Facebook or Google in the case of social login, provides identity attributes to service providers, being website hosting various other applications that you want to use. So instead of providing credentials to those other websites, you can instead trust Facebook to validate your credentials. To move away from the social example and apply this to businesses, think of an internal-facing employee portal with various intranet links to timesheets, insurance information, company directory, etc. Instead of having the employee log into each site with different credentials or accounts, the employee can have the portal authenticate them with the other internet sites. Again, a single username and password to access multiple applications. So how does this work? To understand this, we need to familiarize ourselves with the claims-based model, claims-based identity. It's a common method used by applications to obtain identity information about a user that another application has authenticated. A claim similar to an attribute is a statement that a subject, person, or organization makes of itself or another. For example, it can be a name, email address, age, and also the representation of your right to access a file, server, or service. It differs from an attribute in the delivery method. Where attributes are looked up in the directory, claims are delivered to the application. A security token is used to transfer identity information between the identity provider and service provider. A security token contains the complete set of claims information for a particular user. The security token is issued by the security token services operated by the identity provider. In this approach, trust is explicit. The service provider will believe a claim about the current user only if it trusts the entity that issued the claim. It's up to the identity provider to verify and then guarantee that these claims are true. I'll provide a real life analogy. Think of the airport check-in procedure. When you get to the airport, you first check in with the counter and present your passport. After verifying your passport by matching the documented photo with your face and confirming that you've actually paid for the ticket, the agent prints a boarding pass with relevant information about you. Name, flight, seat, priority, etc. Now you can head to the security checkpoint and into the boarding gate by presenting your boarding pass. In this analogy, a boarding pass is a token containing a set of claims about you, such as name, seat number, and flight number. The gate agent doesn't need to validate those claims you make about yourself because they have been issued and verified by a source that the gate agent trusts, the airline. Now, there's much more that can be discussed about this authentication approach, including security communication mechanisms, and of course, the different standards that would make this interoperable, but I'll leave that to the next webinar, which will be a technical deep dive. For now, let's wrap up with the advantages of this approach. What claims-based identity does is that it removes the responsibility of authentication from applications that puts it in the hands of trusted identity providers. So developers of the various applications don't have to store passwords, 
Instead, they can accept proof of identity or authorization from a trusted source. Increased security and less risk are an advantageous outcome. From a business standpoint, this can elevate practices by improving authentication for business-to-business and business-to-consumer models. So why does SpecOps care about this? Because this is the underlying platform of our UReset service, which sets itself apart from other self-service solutions because it enables multi-factor authentication when addressing password reset security. When a user initiates a password reset or account unlock, they can use any of the supported identity services to verify their identity. So instead of calling the help desk or answering a few questions, they can instead choose Google or their fingerprint or any other identity service that their IT department has made available to them via our platform. Users finally get authentication choice and IT administrators get peace of mind knowing that they won't be calling the help desk. Thank you so much for joining our webinar. Check out our website in the meantime to keep up with ongoing password-related content and if you're curious about our solutions. Until next time, see you soon.